So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a busy Friday night in the East End of London. Firstly, why are we here? We're here tonight to talk about one of the most infamous serial killers in history. Tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey of 1888 Victorian London, and tonight we are doing a Jack the Ripper tour. Firstly, introductions. Uh, I've met some of you before. Thank you for joining me on my next installment of tours in London. My name is Sinead. I'm one of the guides at Free Tours by Foot. Please like and subscribe, and if you are interested, uh, join us and stay with us for the end of the tour. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the canonical five. The five we categorically know are victims of Jack the Ripper. Now, he could be attributed to up to another four different murders in this part of town, but every Ripper guide speaks about the canonical five. Tonight, we're going to walk in these footsteps, and I'm going to bring you to three out of five murder sites. Two of those murder sites no longer exist today. London, of course, was extensively bombed during World War II, and the worst part of London to be hit was here in the East End. But wherever possible, what I will try to do is recreate the crime scenes for you by bringing you down some of the most beautiful 19th century streets in Britain. Now, it's an incredible story for so many particular reasons. Number one, the mystery. You're joining me tonight, but if you're expecting me to tell you tonight who Jack the Ripper is, well, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, I certainly won't be able to tell you that. Criminologists, lecturers, ripperologists, specialists from all over the world, including the FBI and the CIA, have been here investigating Jack the Ripper. Now, if they can't tell you who Jack the Ripper is, I certainly don't claim to be able to do so myself. But I can certainly tell you tonight who I'm pretty sure he is. We'll also speak tonight about the royal conspiracy, centering around Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avon, the grandson of Queen Victoria. Same succession to the throne in 1888 as Prince William is to this day. And it's a great story. And don't we all love a good royal conspiracy, folks? Now, the second reason this case is so historic, folks, make no mistake about the lust that exists for Jack the Ripper. Now, the area of the East End tonight will be exceptionally quiet. And that, of course, is because we're filming this during, well, the COVID pandemic. So that's a great advantage for us. But ordinarily, on a weekend, there will be thousands and thousands of people around here taking Jack the Ripper tours. Um, that's a great advantage for us, as I say. We'll have all the murder sites to ourselves. But the lust that exists for Jack the Ripper today also existed in 1888. This case was the first tabloid sensation in history. One million newspapers a day were being printed about Jack the Ripper. The New York Times reported daily. The Sun newspaper here in London actually reported that Jack the Ripper was an escaped baboon from London Zoo. Nobody believed any human being was capable of such atrocity. But the final reason this case is so historic, the final murder of Jack the Ripper is still described to this day by the FBI as one of the most complex crime scenes in history was also the very first forensic crime scene photograph in history. And that photograph we will include on the tour tonight. He mutilated Mary Jane Kelly beyond all recognition. The only way she could be identified was by the clothing she was wearing the night before. So tonight we're going to walk in his footsteps. We're going to describe his details and murders in details and visit three out of the five murder sites until we finally try and come together and decide if we can solve the history or the mystery of Jack the Ripper. So in order for me to start this story for you, Firstly, I need to bring you back and transport you back to 1888 Victorian London. But more importantly, to the neighborhood we're heading into tonight, 1888 Whitechapel. So 1888 Victorian London. London was the richest, largest city in the world. It was the epicenter of what was known at the time as the British Empire, the largest empire the world had ever seen. Queen Victoria, of course, the reigning monarch, she reigned from 1837 to 1901. 63 years, seven months, and two days on the throne. 
Now, Victoria, just for your own point of interest, not entirely relevant to the case, well, she held the title of longest reigning British monarch up until the 9th of September 2015. When, of course, on that date, she was surpassed by the present queen, who has now become the longest reigning British monarch since 1066. So the Victorian era, folks, was everything you imagined it to be. Opulence, grandeur, and wealth. Ladies, we were in beautiful ball gowns and parasol umbrellas. Gentlemen, top hats and tails. Elegant horse-drawn carriages, dinner parties, balls, and mansions in the West End. What we know today, ladies and gents, is Westminster. Piccadilly Cir Circus, Covent Garden, Leicester Square, Mayfair, Park Lane, and Belgravia. Not, I'm afraid, where we're headed tonight. In the richest, largest city in the world was Whitechapel, one of the worst third world slums known to humanity. Crime was rife, rape, burglary, sexual crime. Now, murder was not uncommon in this part of town, but it was the ferocious, barbaric nature of the ripping of the torso and the removing of organs of the Jack the Ripper case that gripped the world. In this part of town, you lived day to day. Nobody had a permanent address. Nobody had a fixed abode. Nobody had a mortgage or rent. Your accommodation, I use the term loosely, for the privilege of sleeping on six inch horsehair mattresses infested with all types of urine scabies, lice and feces in sometimes overcrowded rooms of up to 24 other people, you were charged four pence for the night. You had to earn that four pence for that roof over your head. The alternative was you slept on the cold, violent streets of Whitechapel. Later on, I'll be showing you an example of what was known as a workhouse, where accommodation was free, but I can assure you it came with a very large price. So four pence your day-to-day -day requirement for that roof over your head. Now, gentlemen, you had some chance of survival. Uh, London, a very busy, rich, industrial port. You would queue on the docks for 16 hours of hard day's manual labor. And whatever money you earned, you would make it stretch for the week for the basic human rights of survival, food, accommodation, and clothing. The area was littered with breweries, tanners, and slaughterhouses. The predominant employer for men in Whitechapel in 1888 Victorian London were slaughter butchers or slaughterhouses, making it 90% likely that most men at one time would have worked with a knife. So gentlemen, some chance of survival. Ladies, we had none at all. If we didn't get a bit of part-time work, cleaning house or doing sewing repair in the richer part of town, and we had sold everything we owned to survive, we were only left with one thing left to sell, ourselves. It is estimated there was up to 1,200 prostitutes working in the Whitechapel in 1888. The youngest prostitute on record, six years of age. Tragic life ensued for these girls. The devil had taken them from the street to the Doss House and the street and back again. But it may have been the worst of times, but as in A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, it could also be the best of times. This area was full of cockney wit and charm, alehouses, pubs, and taverns. Homegrown gin, the drink of choice. The cheapest to make, the quickest to get drunk on. And I'm not talking about a nice little Bombay Sapphire Martini here, ladies and gents. I'm talking about a pint of homegrown gin. This was the type of gin they brewed in bathtubs in their back courtyards. It was so potent, it would strip the paint off the bathtubs. Can you imagine what it did to these girls' faces, insides, and liver? Gin in 1888, Victorian London, was widely regarded to be a method of contraception. I think we'll all agree it has the reverse effect nowadays. Not surprising, all five of Jack the Ripper's victims were prostitutes. All five were chronic alcoholics. Typical day for these girls. They take to the streets, they earn their four pence, into the pub, pint to gin, back out on the streets, this endless, vicious cycle of the jaw of the alcohol. So by the end of the night, they may be left with a decision to make. I have four pence left. Am I spending it on gin or on my accommodation? What do you think won out? Gin, of course, at all times. So it wasn't uncommon to find prostitutes in drunken stupors all over the streets of Whitechapel. No street lighting in 1888. 
So every corner you took, a dark, dangerous, violent atmosphere. Our story begins on the 31st of August, 1888. The autumn of terror is about to begin in the first of the canonical five, Mary Ann Nichols. Now, Mary Ann started out reasonably well. Married at 15, which was commonplace in Victorian times, but at 29, as a result of what was said on the police report, her excessive drinking and her immoral behavior, the marriage crumbled and fell apart. No spousal support coming in and no options. She is doing what she knows how to do best. She is working the streets of Whitechapel. Ladies and gentlemen, she is drinking in this very building here. Now, Erin, my cameraman, will just show you over here. If the keen observer, if you see on the top of this building, you will see the old Victorian pub sign. This was the frying pan pub on Brick Lane. She's drinking in here on the 31st of August in 1888. She leaves the pub and she heads down this very street, Thrall Street, to our regular accommodation, which will be situated roughly where we were, just by that tree, without the four pence for her stay. She knocks on the door, landlord turns her away. Not tonight, Mary, no pay, no stay. Now, he wasn't being unreasonable. She owed him a lot of money in back rent. But she's not too concerned because she's wearing this beautiful new bonnet. She's treated herself. A beautiful new bonnet with a black velvet trim. She says to him, not to worry, sir, I will return. Look at my jolly new bonnet. She leaves the building. She heads about 20 minutes up the street to the Whitechapel High Street, and she's spotted by her best friend, Emily Holland. She is drunk out of her mind. She can barely stand. Emily tries to convince her to return to the accommodation. She even offers to pay her four pence. Again, she's having none of it. She said, I've had my dust money three times tonight. I've drunk it. Won't take me long to earn the fourth. Go back. I'll see you back there. 3.40 a.m. Two chaps by the name of Charles Cross and Robert Paul are heading to the river. They're stable hands at Pickford's stable yard. In the pitch dark, out of the corner of his eye, Charles Cross spots something. What he said in the police report, he assumed was a tarpaulin or a bundle of clothes or something he could sell. He gets excited. Of course he does. He runs over. And of course he heads over and it's the body of a woman. Now she's lying on her back. Her legs are spread. Her skirt has been lifted above her neck. Now he doesn't know if she's drunk, dead, alive, sober breathing, or if she's been sexually assaulted. But I can assure you, he ain't hanging around to find out. He's terrified a policeman would arrive on the scene and he himself would be incriminated in some form of crime as to do with this woman. So instead, the gentleman make a split decision to leave the crime scene and head towards the docks and alert the nearest policeman they see en route. And how right he was, because two minutes later comes P.C. Neal. He sees her, he kicks her, move on, you can't sleep here, on you go. But of course she doesn't move. So to protect her decency, he removes the skirt from around her neck. And as he does, he notices her throat has been slit from left to right, right to left, all the way around the back to her vertebrae, about a centimeter incision apart. He immediately calls her assistance and Metropolitan Police arrive on the scene. Her body remains in that position for three hours while the Metropolitan Police take sketches of the crime scene. Dr. Llewellyn arrives on the scene. He declares life extinct. But he also remarks about something rather curious. There's a distinct lack of blood on the, at the crime scene for such a traumatic neck injury. This puzzles him. Her body is removed. It is taken back to Whitechapel Workhouse Mortuary. And a bucket of water, ladies and gents, thrown all over the evidence. No forensic science in 1888. It's in its infancy, but they're certainly not using it as of yet in either police department in London, of which there are two, the City of London Police and the Metropolitan Police. I will elaborate further later on on the tour. The Metropolitan Police, he's beginning his post-mortem examination. And as he does, he's removing her clothing. And he notices she's wearing nine layers of clothing. Now, remember I told you folks, prostitutes had no permanent address. So everything they own, they carried on their person. She's wearing her entire wardrobe. 
and this explains the blood. Because as he's removing each layer, he notices the blood is coagulated between each layer of her clothing and matted in the back of her head. But it wasn't until he removed that final layer, he discovered the extent of her barbaric injuries. Jack the Ripper, ladies and gentlemen, has repeatedly plunged his knife into her genitalia. He has ripped it wide open to her breast. He has pulled back her skin, and in some sort of misogynistic psychotic frenzy, he has taken his sharp blade and he has slashed and shredded her intestines furiously. But particular focus was always, always on the female reproductive organs. The very first murder of Jack the Ripper took place on the 31st of August, 1888. And I can assure you, ladies and gents, he's only getting warmed up. That is when the greatest detective London has ever seen, the 14-year veteran of the Metropolitan Police Department, is immediately assigned to the case. And I know you're all thinking that that is somebody very famous, but I'm afraid that is not Sherlock Holmes. He's a fictional character. <laughs> Detective Chief Inspector Frederick Abeline of the Metropolitan Police Department. Immediately assigned to the case, determined to bring this butcher to justice. Been played by some of the greatest actors of our generation, actually. Michael Caine played him in the incredible 1988 Jack the Ripper series. And of course, he was played by the devastatingly handsome Mr. Johnny Depp in the movie From Hell. Determined to bring this butcher to justice, he heads into the neighborhood, he retraces her steps. He interviews every single person that spoke to Mary Ann Nichols, and he cannot come up with one clue. But he doesn't have to wait too long. Because exactly to the day, seven days later, Jack the Ripper strikes again. This time, ladies and gentlemen, he murders Annie Chapman at 29 Hanbury Street. That's our next stop tonight on the tour. So come at me to 29 Hanbury Street. So, of course, on our way to the murder site of Ellie Chapman, just a brief mention, of course, and the importance of this is the incredible Brick Lane, uh, home to the Asian community here in London. And Brick Lane, of course, in order to get to Ellie Chapman's murder site, we've got to pass 50 delicious Indian restaurants. A great place to eat when you're here in London. Now, Annie Chapman. Annie Chapman was the eldest of Jack the Ripper's victim. She was 48 years of age. Annie was a tough old broad. Annie had, been, had a rough old life. She had been married, but again, her marriage fell apart. But Annie, the week before she died, Annie was suffering from tuberculosis. Even when they did the post-mortem examination on her body, they suggested she wouldn't have had any more than three weeks to live. So if Jack the Ripper hadn't brutally murdered her, the streets of White Cut Chapel were coming very close. Annie had been in an argument. These girls weren't wallflowers, might I add. These girls were used to streets on London. They were all in gin and physical altercations all the time. But Annie had been in a fight the week before over a bar of soap she had borrowed with another prostitute in the area called Eliza Cooper. Just to give you an example, in that physical altercation, Annie lost all her bottom teeth and all her chest was bruised. Annie did a lot more damage to Eliza Cooper. So the point I'm making is these girls were tough. They were streetwise and well able to look after themselves as it were. But again, Annie had no money that night. A horrendous night here in the 8th of September, 1888. Tired and sick, and she was very sick that night. She begged her landlord to let her stay. She pleaded with him. She even offered to pay him double. He heartlessly turfed her out on the street with no place to go. Annie was spotted right around here on Hanbury Street, speaking to a gentleman who's described as five foot seven, five foot eight, pale complexion, mustache, deer stalker hat, long dusty overcoat, and approximately five seven, five eight. He was described as a shabby genteel of foreign appearance. A shabby genteel 
a shabbily dressed gentleman of foreign appearance. Now, foreign in 1888 Victorian London referred to the Jewish community. So here at 29 Hanbury Street is where she was spotted. She was overheard saying him saying to her, will you? To which she replied, I will. She heads straight through this building, through the communal courtyard to the back courtyard at the back. Now, approximately 5.25 a.m., a man called Albert Kadosh, who lived upstairs at number 31, the building right next door. He overhears, he heads into the back courtyard. He lives on the opposite side of the fence. Now, the fence between both courtyards was only five foot six. He overhears her screaming, no! But ladies and gentlemen, this is Whitechapel in the middle of the night. There's drunks, there's overcrowding, there's domestic abuse. He doesn't think someone's being murdered. He heads to work and passes Christchurch Spitterfields, which I'll show you in a moment. And he records the time as 5.32 a.m. In the meantime, at 5.40 a.m., a man called John Davis, who lived upstairs, had had a very restless night's sleep. He comes downstairs and heads into the courtyard and discovers the body of Annie Chapman. Ladies and gentlemen, her throat has been slit, left to right, right to left. This time, he plunges his knife into her anus and extends the rip the whole way around her vaginal area and up to her breasts. He pulls back her skin, he removes her intestines, and he throws them over her left hand shoulder. Jack the Ripper has also removed her uterus and part of her bowel, and removed and taken her uterus with him. Annie Chapman, the eldest of Jack the Ripper's victims at 48 years of age, the first in daylight and the first where he harvests the trophy, removing and taking with him part of her bowel, her uterus, right at the back of 29 Hanbury Street. So we've had two murders so far, folks. 31st of August, 1888, Mary Ann Nichols, and the 8th of September, 1888, Annie Chapman. All is quiet for nearly three whole weeks. When on the 30th of September, Jack the Ripper doesn't strike once in a night, he strikes twice. What is now known as the infamous double event, he starts his murderous rampage with the Swedish prostitute, Elizabeth Stride. Now we're gonna head a little further into the city of London, but for right now, what I wanna do is show you around Whitechapel today for what was also Whitechapel in 1888, including one of the most beautiful 19th century streets in Britain. Atmospheric, and it's been used for several movies, actually. I've seen them filming a lot of movies over the years here. The Suffragette movie with Kerry Mulligan and Meryl Streep. In fact, Meryl Streep was on the roof of one of these buildings, inciting the girls towards violence. Um, Luther, the show. I've seen periodic dramas being filmed down here, but one of the most beautiful 19th century streets in Britain. Now, these houses regularly go for now today, anything from five to 12 million but not the case in 1888. So not only are we standing in one of the most beautiful 19th century streets in Britain, we were also standing in one of the most multiculturally diverse neighborhoods in the entire of London. And it's important to note that mass migration occurred here. Over 2,000 years ago, it began. Very shortly, we'll be heading into the boundaries of what is called the City of London. Uh, the City of London was established by the Romans 2,000 years ago. And if you're interested in more about the City of London, of course, please like and subscribe and we will give you a link towards the City of London tour, where I bring you through the nooks and crannies of the 2,000-year-old ancient city. But the Romans were the first to arrive, establishing the City of London, and they built a huge Roman wall around that city. The next wave of migration came in the 1700s, and that, of course, was the French Huguenots. And the French Huguenots came here, fleeing persecution in Catholic France, a safe haven here in Protestant England. They brought with them the silk weaving industry, 
an incredible industry, but of course, with the opening of the ports and the industrial revolution and the expansion of the ports, cheaper textiles became more freely available from Asia, and that's when the Huguenots left. But even to this day, you will see the influence of the Huguenots in the French style Huguenot architecture of this street. Even the name of the street, as you'll see yourself, Fournier Street. The next massive wave of migration, of course, was the 1800s, and that's when the Jewish community arrived. It is estimated there was up to 3,000 Jewish people living in the center of Whitechapel in 1888. And of course, they were fleeing their own persecution all over mainland Europe and Tsarist Russia. My own people came with them as well in the 1800s, the Irish. They were fleeing their own horrendous poverty in Ireland. And they were getting on what were known as famine and death ships three weeks crossings to the United States of America. These ships were rife with disease like dysentery, scurvy, um, well, plague, etc. And a lot of people wouldn't survive the journey. So they got off the, the ports and the coastal towns of Britain. 1970s saw another massive wave of migration, and that was the Bangladeshis. The Bangladeshis arrived here to London, and you just saw it, the incredible Brick Lane with over 60 Indian restaurants and a wonderful Asian community. Now, the final wave of migration to the area came most recently, ladies and gents, and that, of course, was the hipsters. And they arrived with quinoa and coffee and avocados. The point I'm making is you also had a massive boiling pot of racial tension in the area, and that will play a huge part later on, as anti-Semitism did in the Jack the Ripper investigation. But for right now, where we're standing is possibly one of the most historic parts of the Jack the Ripper tour. You are presently standing, I am presently standing, and you're presently looking at three of the exact buildings that Jack the Ripper would have seen. Directly behind you here, this building you see here now, a relatively new build, but right in the center of that building was a street here in London called Dorset Street ran straight through the middle of this building. That was the most dangerous street in London, making it quite possibly at the time the most dangerous street in the United Kingdom. If you walked down Dorset Street at night time, you certainly didn't come out with your possessions. You were lucky if you came out alive. That was the address, ladies and gents, of the final victim of Jack the Ripper, Mary Jane Kelly. She lived at 13 Miller's Court on Dorset Street. So what fascinates me is when Jack the Ripper walked out of that crime scene that morning, after mutilating her beyond all recognition, he would have seen the exact same three buildings we are standing under right now. Jack the Ripper would have seen Christchurch Spitterfields, this wonderful Nicholas Hawkmore church. There's been a church on this site since 1700s. That is how the people of Whitechapel told the time including Albert Kadash on his way to work after hearing Annie Chapman screaming no. They, he would have seen Spitterfields Market right behind you, ladies and gentlemen. There's been a market on this site since the reign of King Charles II, the 1600s. That particular building was opened in 1887 by Queen Victoria, one year before the Jack the Ripper murders. And more importantly, and the most integral part of this investigation, the Ten Bells Pub. It's not, well, reputedly, it wouldn't have been uncommon for all five of Jack the Ripper's victims, most likely would have drank in the pub. All these girls lived together locally, would have drank in the same haunts along the way. So it wouldn't have been uncommon for these girls, quite possibly, to have known each other. But more importantly, Mary Jane Kelly, the final victim of Jack the Ripper, was drinking in that pub the night she was brutally murdered right underneath this building here. When you're here in person yourself, there is no better place to further your Jack the Ripper experience. Walking in there is like transporting you back in time with the exact same interior as it had in 1888. Can't guarantee you you'll get two pound, pounds, uh, two pound pints of gin anymore, but alas, worth a visit when you're here. So we're gonna take the tour on next. I wanna show you an example of a workhouse, but you don't want to miss very shortly, we're coming up on the most infamous night in Jack the Ripper history, the infamous double event.
So this is what was called a workhouse. And this was the end of the road. You had no place else to go. Remember I told you about the people with the potential to earn four pence? Well, what about the people with no earning potential? And they were there in their thousands. You had orphaned children on these streets, abandoned by parents who couldn't afford to feed them, living in pickpocketing gangs with no place to go. Where do they go? You shove them in here. Go ahead, you're fine. What about the elderly that survived the lifespan? They can't turn a trick. They can't do 16 hours of hard days manual labor. Where did they go? They were shoved in here. Or more dangerously, what about the mentally ill? There was no such thing as medication or help for the mentally ill. You had some very dangerously sick, criminally insane people on these streets with no medication and no help. They too were sho shoved in here. The women's entrance was here and the men's entrance, we'll show you in a moment, was on the other side. Two and three hundred women and children a night queued up on each entrance. If the beds were gone, you were offered a rope that was tied around your waist and attached to the wall. And you slept hanging on, where we believe the term hangers on came from. If the beds were gone, rats and mice ran freely, insects up the wall, disease was rife. Women and children all crammed into the same area. You were offered a bowl of gruel and a piece of bread so rock hard it had to be soaked in boiling water for, in order for you to even take a bite. And for the privilege of this five-star accommodation, you had 16 hours of hard days manual labor, breaking rock and picking rope and something to do with the sorting of matches. But if I can turn any positives from all these negatives, remember I told you about the publicity. People all over the world, folks, were reading about Jack the Ripper. The New York Times reported daily, the Sun newspaper here in London, again, as I mentioned earlier on, reported that Jack the Ripper was an escaped baboon. But more importantly, one million newspapers a day were being printed about Jack the Ripper. People started to take notice. They started to question why in the richest, largest city in the world were there people living in these conditions? Massive social reform came about as a result of the deaths of these girls. So I genuinely like you to think these girls didn't die in vain. They changed the course of history for the better for future generations. The Bernardo's Children's Trust came in. They picked up children off the streets to send them to Australia and New Zealand for better lives. The Church of England, the Catholic Church, the Samaritans all got involved. So if you can turn any positive, that was one good thing to come from these murders. But right now we're going to head into the city of London because right now we're going to walk down because I want to start what was the most infamous two murders in the Jack the Ripper investigation. This was the double event. But if we have any Harry Potter fans on the tour, now this is quite controversial. I get a lot of criticism about this from Harry Potter guides. 50% say this is based on the area I'm about to tell you, and 50% say it's not. But, as far as I'm concerned, not a huge Harry Potter fan, I'm afraid. I don't know much about him, not, not that I'm a fan, but uh, if you are interested in Harry Potter, see our expert guide. Uh, he did his Harry Potter tour here with free tours. Apparently, they say this was the inspiration for Diagon Alley in the Harry Potter movies. So we've had two murders so far, 31st of August, 1888, and the 8th of September, 1888. All is quiet for nearly three whole weeks, when on the 30th of September, Jack the Ripper doesn't strike once in a night, he strikes twice, in what is now known as the infamous double event, in under 45 minutes, he has brutally murdered two girls in the East End. The significant part about this investigation, however, is there are two police forces in London that still exist to this day. The City of London Police and the Metropolitan Police. The City of London are responsible for the City of London, the ancient City of London, which is only 1.1 square mile. The Metropolitan Police are responsible for the 31 boroughs outside. The significant part of this investigation is we are very shortly entering into the city of London. And the way we know this is right now, I 
I'm in the Metropolitan Police Department district. But these pillars, these red, white, and black, and just a simple step right through here, I am now in the City of London precinct. Very significant later on, and I'll get further into detail with that coming up shortly. But for right now, I want to talk about Elizabeth Stride. Not the exact murder site of Elizabeth Stride. Elizabeth Stride was murdered in the Metropolitan District. But I'll improvise right now. Elizabeth Stride. The only non-English victim of Jack the Ripper came from Gothenburg in Sweden. Moved here at 22, she married a local chap named John Stride. They were reasonably happy, had a coffee shop, but of course he dies suddenly at a very young age. And like everything else, she's left with nothing, no capital, no gains. She is working the streets in Whitechapel, but she's what we call an unfortunate. She had a lot of part-time work, so she very rarely worked the streets, but for whatever reason that night, it's a Saturday night, she is working. Particularly nasty London night. Gale force winds, hail, rain, a horrendous evening. The key to this story is a Russian Jewish man named Louis Dean Schutz. He had a pub. The pub was called the International Workmen's Educational Club. He ran the pub with his wife. He lived above the pub with his wife. But on the weekends, he sold costume jewelry at market stalls all around London. He's returning that night on his horse and cart. Now picture the scenario. The pub is on the right. And between two buildings, there's a stable here. Yeah, there's a laneway back to the stables behind the pub called Duffield's Yard. He heads in with his horse on a loose rein. Halfway through, all of a sudden, the horse just stops, suddenly in its tracks. Louis Deemschutz is puzzled. The horse has made this journey a million times before. So in the pitch dark, he descends the carriage. And using his whip, he feels around for an obstruction. And of course, he feels a large mass or bundle. So he bends down and strikes a match. Immediately, in the gusty conditions, that match blows out, but not before he discovers there's a body of a woman in the alleyway. He said on the police report he thought it was his wife in a drunken stupor as he had picked her up from there drunk on gin so many times before. So still thinking he's dealing with his wife, he heads, leaves the alleyway. He heads into the pub to retrieve his oil lantern to come back and pick up his drunk wife. He walks into the pub and the first person he sees, his wife. He returns to the scene of the crime and he discovers the body of Elizabeth Stride. She has only one slit on her neck. No other marking. Her body is still warm. She has to have just taken her last breath. This begs us to believe that if in fact instead Louis Deanshuts had lit that match directly in front of him, he would have been looking directly into the eyes of Jack the Ripper. We believe Jack the Ripper was disturbed mid-murder in that alleyway. And when Louis Deemschultz leaves that alleyway, gives Jack the Ripper the vital seconds he needs to escape. But now we have a very serious problem on our hands. You have a frenzied psychopath with a brutal loss for mutilation of corpses and removing of organs that is not been satisfied. Jack the Ripper satisfies that lust 45 minutes later when he brutally mutilates Catherine Eddowes at our next stop tonight at the infamous Mitre Square. It was virtually impossible to catch a killer in 1888. But the one thing that the police agreed on was prostitution was illegal. However, they weren't completely unreasonable. They knew this was the only source of income for women in this part of town. So they agreed two rules with the prostitutes. Number one, the prostitute could not loiter. She couldn't stand in the one position for a long period of time. She had to keep moving at all times. Number two, the prostitute could not approach a customer, the customer would have to approach her. 
For that reason, ladies and gents, do you see this magnificent church? Excuse the traffic. Same vault off without all gate church. Up to 200 prostitutes a night continuously circled that church. That's where men came to solicit the trade of prostitutes. It's where Jack the Ripper goes next, because it's the last known sighting of the fourth victim of Jack the Ripper, Catherine Eddowes. So there was an eyewitness report of who we suspect Jack the Ripper to be right at the top of this passage. So this is St. James's passage now, but in 1888, this was church passage. So we suspect that after the murder of Elizabeth Stride, Jack the Ripper came straight to the prostitute's church, picked up Catherine Eddowes, was spotted speaking to her here, no doubt negotiating what they called at the time the four pence knee trembler at the top of that passageway. And not 15 minutes later, her brutally mutilated body was found right down here in the, this side corner of the infamous Mitre Square. Now, this is a recent dedication that was put up to Catherine Eddowes here at Mitre Square. But of course, we will be providing images of these murders. So this is the infamous Mitre Square. Now, Mitre Square in 1888, Victorian London, was warehouses full of valuable goods. In a neighborhood full of scavengers and thieves, this square was required police presence every 15 minutes. The police officer on duty that evening, if he wasn't through here on the 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, he was regularly spot checked by his chief inspector, he would be fired on the spot. That police officer that evening was PC Edmund Watkins. He had been around here at 1.30 a.m., shining his torch in every corner with nothing to report. There's an eyewitness report of who we suspect Jack the Ripper to be, speaking to Catherine Eddowes at the top of that passageway at 1.35 a.m. Now, we all have this kind of a Hollywood idea, folks, of what we suspect Jack the Ripper looked like. And it's due in part down to the 1929 iconic image of Alfred Hitchcock. Let me see if I get this right. Six foot two, long black flowing cape, deerstalker hat like Sherlock Holmes, cane, and fog are always around the ankles. Love that bit, the fog around the ankles. Not the case. Again, this gentleman was described as five foot seven, five foot eight, late twenties, early thirties, pale complexion, mustache, stocky build, not fat, more stocky and chubby. He was wearing a peak cap, a red neckerchief around his neck, and an oversized salt and pepper coat, gray and white coat, overall giving the appearance of an international sailor. He was spotted speaking to Catherine Eddowes at 1.35 a.m. P.C. Watkins had been around here at 1.30 a.m. And when P.C. Watkins returned to Mitre Square at 1.45 a.m., he would have found the brutally mutilated body of Catherine Eddowes right behind these gates here. Jack the Ripper has taken his barbaric fury out on Catherine Eddowes. He starts again with her neck, left to right, right to left. This time, he removes two triangular pieces of flesh from her cheeks, the top of her nose, the tips of her ears. He plunges his knife into her genitalia, extending his rip above her breasts. He pulls back her skin, he removes her entrails, and throws them over the left-hand shoulder. Jack the Ripper is removed and taken with him part of her bowel, and this time, Jack the Ripper has removed and taken with him, my apologies, he's taken part of her uterus, and this time he's removed and taken with him her kidney. Now we all have some sort of a reasonable idea as to where our kidney is located, right in our lower backs. But when, Jack the, when Dr. Baxter Phillips examined her body, he noticed that Jack the Ripper has done this in an estimated 12 to 15 minutes in the pitch dark with police presence every 15 minutes in public around here without damaging any other internal organ in the process. Dr. Bagster Phillips was the very first doctor to suggest that Jack the Ripper had to have some surgical or anatomical knowledge. However, 
These streets are alive in 1888 Victorian London at night time. There is mass overcrowding, people everywhere on the streets. And you have a now a psychotic murderer covered in blood. He has to be. He's murdered twice in under 45 minutes. He's covered in blood. He's carrying a kidney. You see a man coming towards you in the middle of Whitechapel at nighttime covered in blood. Would you find that unusual? Some would say immediately yes, but not the case. Not if you were a butcher. Butchers came home covered in blood every night of the week in Whitechapel, folks. There was even buckets of water around the corner of the streets, so men could wash their hands of animal blood. Also, did you know the anatomy of a pig is very similar to the anatomy of a human being? Was Jack the Ripper a butcher? Could Jack the Ripper have been a barber? You've all heard of the demon barber of Sweeney Todd on Fleet Street, a fictional character. But barbers in 1888 Victorian London were members of the surgical guild. They were legally allowed to perform minor surgical procedures. There was no money for NHS or for surgery. Gentlemen, you needed your mustache trim and your appendix out. Hey, hey, two for one of the barbers. Okay, slight exaggeration. He could remove your wisdom teeth. He could stitch you up after a bar fight. An anesthetic, ladies and gents, in 1888 Victorian London was a shot of whiskey. I say they should come to Ireland. We're ready for surgery all the time. Was Jack the Ripper a barber? We don't know, but what we do know is exactly where Jack the Ripper went next. And there's very few clues in the Jack the Ripper investigation, but one hour later, PC Alfred Long of the Metropolitan Police Department on his beat was passing the Wentworth Model dwelling building on Goulston Street. As he was passing, he discovered a triangular bloodied piece of Catherine Edo's apron. Written in red chalk up on the wall above that piece of apron where the Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Spelt J-U-W-E-S. The Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Now the hell of all that I can tell you about it, I'm afraid, because there's nothing that anybody knows. It's known as the famous non-clue. But we're going to discuss it and we'll discuss the conspiracy surrounding it. So effectively, right now, ladies and gents, we are walking the exact footsteps of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, ladies and gentlemen, was in that building. This is the Wentworth Model Dwelling Building on Goulston Street. The reason we know this is PC Alfred Law of the Metropolitan Police Department was walking right past this main entrance, which should have been wide open. And he found a triangular piece of bloodied apron of Catherine Eddowes on the floor. Written in red chalk above that piece of apron up on the wall where the Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Spelt J-U-W-E-S. The Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing. Detective Chief Inspector Aberline and Commissioner Charles Warren of the Metropolitan Police Department, the commissioner, arrived to the crime scene. And when Commissioner Charles Warren, upon inspection of the Jews of the men who will not be blamed for no nothing, immediately instructed the Jews of the men be rubbed off the wall. In modern day terms, ladies and gentlemen, that is what you would call tampering with evidence. Why did he do it? Some people say he suggested he didn't want any more anti-Semitic writing in the neighborhood. This area was predominantly Jewish. That building was a Jewish tenement. Petticoat Lane Market an hour later would have been set up along here. Predominantly Jewish vendors at the market. And he was afraid of any more anti-Semitic writing. Tensions were so high in the neighborhood at the time. But the people wouldn't accept it. People were furious. He actually lost his job three weeks later. They said it was a cover-up. The City of London Police are now involved in the investigation. They haven't even had a chance to photograph it or take some evidence of it. But what does it all mean? What is it all about? I mean, frankly, we have no categoric proof that Jack the Ripper even wrote this. But there's been several conspiracy theories of the, over the years. Some suggest that Jack the Ripper was illiterate. Was he illiterate with the wrong spelling? 
Or was Jack the Ripper directly translating from his own language into English? There's no double negative. Grammatically, that sentence is constructed all wrong. There is no um, double negative in an English language sentence. But there are double negatives in Yiddish. And there are double negatives in Polish. Some would even suggest that it was a Freemason reference. Whatever what we do know is Jack the Ripper was in this building. Now, when the FBI profiled Jack the Ripper, they suggested that Jack the Ripper would have lived in the locality. There is no way he could have negotiated the streets of London so quickly in the pitch dark without knowing exactly where he was going. Did Jack the Ripper live in this building? We know he swiped the blade of his knife, and we also know he wiped his hands on that piece of apron. So effectively, all we can positively tell you was he came to this building. Quick recap. 31st of August, 1888, the Autumn of Terror begins. Jack the Ripper strikes for the very first time. He murders Mary Ann Nichols. The double rip of the neck, the vaginal laceration to the breast, and the slashing of her intestines furiously. Seven days later, he strikes again. He murders Annie Chapman, the eldest of his victims of 48 years of age, the first in daylight, her body discovered at 540, and the first where he harvests a trophy. Removing and taking with him part of her bowel, her uterus, and also removing, leaving her personal effects in front of her. Three weeks later, not another until the double event. Elizabeth Stride, we suspect, interrupted, and 45 minutes later, the brutal mutilation of Catherine Eddowes at Mitre Square. Not one more word from Jack the Ripper for nearly six whole weeks. 9th of November, traditionally here in London, folks, is Lord Mayor's Day. The new Lord Mayor of London, a ceremonial post, has paraded past the wonderful buildings in the city. St. Paul's Cathedral has his own ceremonial parade. All the kings, the queens, horses, and all the king's men will arrive. The lords, the ladies, the higher up men members of society will be invited. It doesn't affect the people of Whitechapel. They're not invited to Lord Mayor's Day, but it's a great excuse to have a party. They've had enough, folks. Their whole world is upside down, as if their day-to-day -day wasn't hard enough. Every single day, they lived in paralyzing fear of Jack the Ripper. They didn't know who he was going to strike next. Every corner they took, they knew he'd be there. So they need something to celebrate. Remember that they're alive. So they're having a street party, a street fair. The bunting is going up on the streets. They're brewing the gin. They're handing out the free bread. When on the morning of the 9th of November, 1888, the discovery of the body of Mary Jane Kelly. All of Jack the Ripper's victims were between 38 and 48. Mary Jane Kelly was 25 years of age. He mutilated her beyond all recognition. The only way she could be identified was by the clothing she was wearing the night before. Still described to this day by the FBI as one of the most complex crime scenes in history, it was also the very first forensic crime scene photograph in history. And why? Well, we all know he's escalating, ladies and gents. But this was the first and only murder indoors. Jack the Ripper had all the time in the world to create his masterpiece and fulfill his fantasies without fear of getting caught. 9th of November, 1888, the final victim of Jack the Ripper. Mary Jane Kelly. Now, Mary Jane Kelly, the final victim of Jack the Ripper, was an Irish girl from County Limerick. She had a boyfriend. His name was Joseph Barnett. They were on one week. They were off the next. They had a rather tumultuous relationship. He occasionally shared the accommodation with her at 13 Miller's Court. We estimate 13 Miller's Court to be inside the glass window here, just a little bit around there where the elevator was. Now, they have outlined what was Dorset Street. Remember I explained this to you earlier on that ran through the building, the most dangerous street in London. But Mary Jane and Joseph Barnett, he wasn't around that week. They'd had a rather tumultuous argument the week before. A pane of glass had been broken at the side of her building. She had stuffed it with newspapers and rags to keep out the cold. Mary Jane was drinking that night in the Ten Bells pub. She was spotted speaking to a gentleman who she brought back here to 13 Miller's Court. 
She was heard singing an Irish lullaby at 2 a.m. in the morning. She was heard singing again at 3 a.m. in the morning. Mary Jane was 29 shillings in arrears in rent to a man called John McCarthy, a horrible man that she owed over six weeks rent to. That morning, John McCarthy sent his muscle, an ex-military man by the name of Thomas Boyer, around to her address to retrieve the 29 shillings she owed. He knew she wouldn't have 29 shillings, but he was sent to get whatever he could by any means necessary. He's banging on the door, there's no response. He keeps banging and banging. I'll catch her hiding. I know about that broken window. He heads around to the side of the building. He pushes in the rags. He looks inside and his knees buckle, trembling in terror. The first policeman on the scene refuses to enter the crime scene, as does the second policeman refuse to enter. The third bangs down the door and enters the crime scene. He slips on the blood. Jack the Ripper has mutilated Mary Jane Kelly beyond recognition. He's almost entirely severed her head. She's lying on the, be the bed, her face is staring at that window as they were looking in. He has removed both of her breasts. One is on the side table, one is found under what's left of her thigh. A massive gouge of flesh has been removed from her thigh and placed on the inside window sill. He cuts her entire body in two removes her intestines and hangs them like trophies on picture frames all over the room. Her heart is missing from the crime scene. It has never, ever been recovered. Her lungs, her uterus, and her kidneys are found in various parts of the room, and he's not done yet. This time, he takes his blade to her skin, and he almost entirely skins her body. He even folds that skin in neat piles and places it beside the spleen on the side table. That crime scene photograph, ladies and gentlemen, took place right here in the East End. The first forensic crime scene photograph in history. Now, for the faint-hearted, ladies and gentlemen, we will be showing you an image of that crime scene. So if you have younger ch children, just a little disclaimer, please let them know we will be showing it coming up. So beware, if you are squeamish, it's not for the faint-hearted. So who was Jack the Ripper? Ladies and gentlemen, there's been over 300 suspects of the Jack the Ripper investigation. People are investigating this case since 1888, and they are still investigating today, and they will be in another 100 years. Uh, the mystery of Jack the Ripper is the draw. Let's talk about a few of the suspects, and of course I have my own opinion. I am not a Ripperologist. These are all speculations on my part, as they are on everybody else's. The idea behind Jack the Ripper is discovering who he is. Now, over 300 suspects, you could narrow it down to the 10 most popular. I'll just give you a briefing of some of the more few and some who I would veer towards. Firstly, Aaron Kosminski, Polish, Paranoid, schizophrenic ex-butcher. Lived in Whitechapel fits the physical description of Jack the Ripper. He's in the top three of every Ripperologist in the world. Spent most of his life after the Jack the Ripper investigations in an asylum. Had been arrested for a sexual assault against his own sister. He will always be on the lips of every Ripperologist, Aaron Kosminski. Montague Jewett, ex-school teacher, ex-banker, ex-barrister. Lived in Whitechapel again for the physical and a description of Jack the Ripper. His own family swore he was Jack the Ripper. He committed suicide not long after the Ripper murders. Was found floating on the River Thames. He's also on the list. Walter Sickert. The very famous crime author, Patricia Cornwell, is obsessed with Walter Sickert. She's invested two million pounds of her own money in this investigation. She's convinced it's Walter Sickert. An impressionist artist who lived in both Camden and Whitechapel was known for his depiction of violent scenes against women in art, in particular one which was very similar to the crime scene of Mary Jane Kelly. He comes up a lot, but he's also coming up in the Royal Conspiracy. Now, the Royal Conspiracy centers around Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avon, the grandson of Queen Victoria. Same succession to the throne in 1888 as Prince William is to this day. And he loved his prostitutes. And more importantly, he loved the brothels here in Whitechapel. It is said 
He frequented these brothels on a lot of occasions. He was known to the girls. He used to dress in disguise as a commoner, peaked hat and all. Queen Victoria finds out about these extracurricular activities. She is furious. She sends him back down here to work as an apprentice artist under Walter Sickert. Keep an eye on him. Keep him away from these people. Distract him. Teach him about the Renaissance, the humanities, the Reformation. But whilst he's here, that backfires because they say he fell in love with a prostitute and she falls pregnant with the future king or queen of Great Britain. A prostitute mother from Whitechapel? Queen Victoria is furious. She sends a royal surgeon, Sir William Gull, into the streets of Whitechapel to fix the problem. William Gull was 73 years of age at the time. He had suffered a very debilitating stroke two years prior. I personally don't think this possible. I'll come back to that again when I speak about the FBI profile. It is said William Gull comes into the streets of Whitechapel. He finds the pregnant prostitute and he commits her to an asylum she's never heard from again, nor is the royal baby. But they also say one girl finds out about the royal baby. And that girl is Mary Jane Kelly, the fifth victim of Jack the Ripper. And she tells her four friends, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, and Catherine Eddowes. It is said all five girls had a, um, well, they had a royal plot, a plot to bribe the royal family about the royal baby. It is also said he entices these girls into a royal carriage using poison grapes laced with opium and murders them in a royal carriage. And that bit, forensically, I can tell you, is nonsense, and here's why. The FBI profiled Jack the Ripper as being a white male, late 20s, early 30s. Would have lived in Whitechapel. There was no way he could negotiate the streets of London so quickly in the pitch dark between murders without knowing exactly where he was going. Would have been full-time employed Monday to Friday. All the murders took place on the weekends. Would possibly have been known to these girls. Would have been perceived as a loner. Would have suffered from some form of impediment, whether it be speech or limp or impotency, something he couldn't get over. He would have suffered from some form of a sexual abuse in his background involving a close female relative or a mother, but they also suggested that those girls were murdered exactly where they were found and not in any royal carriage. They also suggested he would have been picked up once, if not twice, for the Jack the Ripper investigation and would be on the police's radar. For that reason, I believe that Walter Sicker couldn't possibly be Jack the Ripper because no royal carriage involved is one of the reasons, and also his age and the physicality of the crime. Personally, I believe that Jack the Ripper, and this is my suggestion, I'm not saying he is Jack the Ripper, but I would lean towards, is probably a better way of saying, is a man called Francis Tumblety. Francis Tumblety was a fantasist. Lived in Whitechapel for a period of time, was known to the girls. He went by the title Dr. Francis Tumblety. Never studied medicine in his life, but he was practicing medicine. He'd been arrested for performing illegal abortions and procuring of illegal drugs. Lived in Whitechapel, fit the physical description. Tumbledee, they found sexual abuse involving his own mother in his background. The problem with Tumbledee was he was arrested two nights before the murder of Mary Jane Kelly in Liverpool for what were known at the time as gross indecency acts. They translate today as homosexual acts. Now, he doesn't fit the profile because a homosexual serial killer is more inclined to kill men and not women. However, years later, they found a wife. He had been married for a short period of time. And they had found out that his marriage had fallen apart as a result of him using prostitutes. The morning that Mary Jane Kelly's body was found, the Metropolitan Police immediately issued a warrant for Tumbledee's arrest. They were desperate to talk to Tumbledee. That day, he fled the country. And he left on that very day. And one detective followed him and never left his side to the day he died. There was a similar murder when he was in New York of a prostitute, the exact same rip of the neck, and the vaginal laceration to the breast. He had a dinner party in his apartment. And at that dinner party, an army general that attended immediately rang the police after to say that Tumbledee had proudly displayed the collection of uteruses 
he so casually kept in jam jars of alcohol all over his apartment. The British government attempted to extradite him. The US government de denied it, the extradition attempt, because for lack of sufficient evidence. And they were perfectly right. Because there was no forensic proof or category proof that Tumbledee was Jack the Ripper and eventually Tumbledee died. Was Tumbledee Jack the Ripper? We will never know. But ladies and gentlemen, research is available on so many sites on this investigation. This was my interpretation of Jack the Ripper. Of course, not everybody will agree with my idea of Jack the Ripper, and not everybody can agree on who I suggested was Jack the Ripper, and that's the beauty of this investigation. Please comment, ladies and gentlemen, share your, any questions you may have with us, and we'll attempt to answer them. But for right now, we're gonna finish up the tour tonight right here at the center and right beside the murder of Mary Jane Kelly. May these ladies rest in peace and thank you very much for joining me this evening. We hope you enjoyed the tour. If you did, please give me a like and subscribe. Anytime you wanna join us on that, then we will keep you notified of our other tours. Thanks for joining Free Tours by Foot and see you all very soon.